I asked Kelly if she would come in today and talk about um, pesticide drift. So Kelly, welcome. Yeah, thank okay. you. You're good? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good morning everyone. So as Jenny mentioned, today I'm gonna talk to you about pesticide drift liability, probably a good follow-up after Mark's presentation. Uh, so I will go ahead and get started. First, uh, Jenny already talked a little bit about our program, but I just wanna reference our website up there. We have a number of legal resources on that website. It's not just about pesticide drift liability. We have a ton of estate planning materials, other liability issues that might impact your farm operation. So I highly recommend that you take a look at our website. We also have our email address down here. If you have any ideas for the future on topics that we could cover legally related that would be really helpful for your operation, please feel free to email us or even contact Jenny and make some suggestions to her on what we can talk about in the future. So just a disclaimer, I am an attorney, but this is not legal advice. This is just legal education, so keep that in mind. I'm going to reference a bunch of other states' laws because we haven't had a lot of issues with pesticide drift liability in Maryland. So keep that in mind as well, that state laws do vary, and how Maryland might deal with these topics in the future uh, is kind of unknown at this point. So. Uh, just remember that, and if you have any issues specific to your operation, you really need to consult your individual attorney. Uh, that's not something that our role can do for you. We also have an info line, so if you have any uh, issues related to the law that you want to maybe discuss with one of us first before you meet with your attorney, uh, the number's right up there. Um, again, we can't provide legal advice, but hopefully we can get you to a point where you can go um, and decide whether or not you actually need to meet with an attorney. And then we also have a blog, um, and this blog talks about the more current issues that are happening. So any hot legal topics um, that might be in the news will probably be on our blog. And then we have a podcast. Uh, Paul will read the blog to you if you do not want to read it to yourself. So just an overview, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk about pesticide drift liability. I'm going to use um, some of the issues with the new dicamba products as an example, but this could be uh, any pesticide in the future or current pesticides that I'm talking about. So when I reference those products, just keep that in mind that I could be talking about any pesticide. So how many of you are concerned about pesticide drift liability? Anyone? A couple? How many of you have heard about um, some of the legal issues in the news related to the new Roundup Ready Extend soybean system? Quite a bit of you, yeah. So just a quick overview, of course, as you know, Dicamba's been around for a while. Um, with the new products, uh, people who aren't familiar with uh, particularly uh, pesticides will say, oh, what's this new product, what's this new product? It's not exactly a new pesticide. Of course, it's been around since the 60s, but with these new products, they're regulated differently than the, the older products um, that have been on the market for quite a while. So with these new products, um, the dicamba tolerant cotton seeds were released by Monsanto in 2015. And then in 2016, they released their uh, dicamba tolerant soybeans. Um, but their uh, pesticide that corresponds with those soybeans and cotton seeds was not released until the end of 2016. So there were some damage reports throughout the Midwest and the South related um, to dicamba in 2016. But uh, whether or not that was actually from um, older dicamba or other products, um, that's something that's being litigated. A big issue there in the Midwest and the South, not so much here on the East Coast. Um, and then, of course... Uh, Ingenia was approved at the end of 2016, Extendimax at the end of 2016, those are Monsanto and BASF's products, um, and then in 2017 was the full rollout and DuPont's Fexapan was approved by the EPA then. Of course, as you've seen in the news, there have been a large number of damage reports throughout the Midwest and the South, um, allegedly from these new dicamba products or maybe use of old dicamba products that were not applied um, according to the law. So uh, kind of two different eras of issues that have happened with these new products. 
Uh, here's an example from um, the University of Missouri, um, their weed scientist, of just some of the damage reports throughout the Midwest and the South. Again, here on the East Coast, uh, hasn't been as big of an issue. But based on these reports, um, there have been some changes to the new dicamba products and how they are regulated. Um, just an overview again, uh, there are penalties that can be faced if you do not apply any pesticide according to its label. Um, if you violate it in Maryland, there's a fine of up to $2,500 for the first violation, and then anywhere up to $5,000 per additional violation, um, a total of $25,000 can be fined if it's the same set of circumstances. Uh, but throughout the uh, South and Midwest, there have been um, an increasing amount of fines related to the new dicamba product specifically. Um, some producers in Missouri have faced fines from $1,500 to $62,000 for not following the label and not applying these products appropriately. Um, with that, states have reacted, of course, as you've seen in the news, to these new products. There are three different ways states can regulate pesticide products. The first one, of course, um, they can just implement a state law that would have to be passed through their legislature, signed by the governor. Uh, so they can kind of regulate it how they want. They can change the federal label. They can ban a product if they wish to. Uh, they have that authority under federal law to do that. There is also state administrative regulation. So maybe the State Department of Ag has authority in a state to regulate those products. So maybe the Delaware um, Department that has that authority will regulate a pesticide one way, and Maryland could regulate it another way. So. That's why it's really important to pay attention to what your Department of Ag is doing related to these pesticide products, any pesticide in general. Um, it could vary from state to state. I think Mark mentioned that with a few examples that he gave of things that might be approved in Delaware and may still be working on approval here in Maryland. So make sure you're keeping an eye on that. And then I know Mark also mentioned um, this thing called a 24C label. A lot of people are like, what is this? What does this mean? Uh, this is just a label that is uh, specifically approved by the EPA. Um, it's specific just to that state. So it will be on there um, right in bold at the top of the label. It will say fifth for a section 24C special local need. What this means is there are different regulations in your state for that product than there are in other states. So keep that in mind. Make sure you're reading this label carefully because there will be changes. Uh, specifically with the new dicamba products, a lot of states have taken on um, this as a way to regulate the products instead of the other two options that they have. So uh, in the future with any product, not just the new dicamba products, look for that label and if there is a 24C on it, just make sure you're reading it very carefully. Of course, with the new products, um, there is a label that you're required to follow, so you don't have to have those uh, fines happen in the future. Um, you can be fined at the federal level as well as the state level. The EPA is a little more lenient on their fines the first time you'll get a warning. Um, after that, it'll be $1,000 um, per violation, so uh, that's something to keep in mind as well, that those fines could double up. Uh, so it is really important to make sure you read the label and follow it. Um, of course, with the older versions of dicamba, you're not allowed to use them in crop and over the top of crops. Um, that's what some of the producers in the Midwest and South have been uh, charged with, um, is using those old products um, not according to those labels. Now with the new dicamba products, the label has changed um, for 2018. Uh, of course, there's the specific pesticide training that will happen today um, when the meeting concludes. Uh, that's one of the new requirements of these labels. The companies have worked with the EPA to create this new uh, restricted use label. Before that, the products were just a general use label. You didn't have to do any specific training. Um, now certified applicators have to receive this specific training. There's also a few other changes. So you cannot spray it if the wind is faster than 10 miles an hour. Previously, last year, you could spray it up to 15 miles an hour. You also have new record keeping requirements. Uh, you have to keep records for two years with these new products, um, and you have to have those records filled out within 14 days after your application of the products. You cannot spray them um, if it's not daylight out, so that's something that was not on the old label is now on the new label for these products. 
There are also more specific tank cleanout requirements than last year. Um, there, of course, were tank cleanout requirements last year. They're just a little more detailed on the label for this year. And then there's additional sensitive crop language. Um, you should look around, consult your neighbors, see if there are any non-tolerant um, um, crops that they're planting, what they're planting, uh, see if it could potentially damage their crops, as well as checking the state sensitive crop registry. Um, that's on the Maryland Department of Ag's website. Uh, if you Google sensitive crop registry for Maryland, you should be able to check that as well. Um, of course, there are a number of other label requirements that will remain for 2017 to make sure um, you're reading specifically uh, this label. It's fairly long, and again, if you don't comply, uh, there have been producers that have been fined in the Midwest and the South for not applying these products appropriately. There are also a number of lawsuits um, that you probably have seen in the news related to these new dicamba products specifically. Um, there's a class action lawsuit of farmers um, that had damage to their crops. Um, they grew uh, crops that um, were not tolerant to dicamba products and uh, have allegedly been damaged by these products. Um, this is in a big case, uh, multi-district litigation case, so kind of like the Syngenta uh, big class action lawsuits that you saw. Uh, this is similar to where they're all combined in one specific case. So class actions from all over. Uh, the only thing that's really um, important to note, unless you feel like you need to join one of these class action lawsuits, is that there are uh, preliminary and permanent injunctions in these cases. So it's something to keep an eye on if this is a product that you want to use. What that means is the court could potentially ban these products from being used. Um, of course, this will probably take several years to go through the process in court, but just something to keep an eye on to see if in the future um, these products might be banned or not. There are, again, a number of other cases related to this. Um, there's one that is suing the EPA um, for their approval of this. So again, another way that these products um, could be pulled from the market. So just some things to keep an eye on, especially if you're interested in using these products in the future. So where are we going? So when reviewing Maryland laws, again, as I uh, mentioned, there are no reported court decisions related to pesticide drift, drift liability, but there are some in other states. So usually what state courts do when they don't have something to follow in their own state is to look at other states. So that's what we're going to do. We'll look at other states and kind of base uh, how we can advise people on pesticide drift liability related to those uh, claims in those other states. There are a couple of different legal claims um, that have been based on pesticide drift liability in other states that I'm going to talk about. Uh, specifically, um, just again an overview, um, there are really no uniform decisions, so that makes it even more difficult for me to advise you on what to do in the future. Uh, it's hard to manage uh, pesticide drift liability when courts are all over the board with this, but that's something to keep in mind as well since we don't know how Maryland courts would react if a case was ever brought to them. So one claim that's popular with pesticide drift liability is negligence, and this is simply a failure to exercise a duty of care under the circumstances. There's also trespass, so this is when um, a person enters your land without your consent and remains there without your consent. But this can also be something under your control. So it doesn't have to be a person. Um, say you throw a baseball onto your neighbor's property and it remains there without their consent. That means you are still trespassing onto their property. And then there's also nuisance. Um, this is something that affects another person's enjoyment of their property. So there have been pesticide drift claims related to this. Um, this is when it's a substantial and unreasonable interference that impacts how a person can use their land. So drift as negligence. There are four separate factors that you have to prove in order to actually win a claim related to negligence. So this is a pretty hard standard to prove, especially when it comes to pesticide drift liability. Um, specifically, you have to prove that you owed a duty of care to act reasonable under the circumstances to that person. Then you have to show that you breached that duty. Then you have to show that the breach was the actual cause of the harm and damage. And then you actually have to show damages. So in some cases with the new dicamba products specifically, 
Um, the yields haven't uh, decreased from the damage. So uh, a court would look at that and say, you know, there's no actual monetary damages here, so you don't have a claim. Uh, specifically, the two hardest factors to prove in a case of negligence with drift liability are these two. So when you breach a duty, it basically means that you're acting like an unreasonable person. So what would a reasonable person do in the, that situation? This is sometimes hard to prove with pesticide drift liability, especially if you follow the label, if you've taken all the proper precautions. And then, of course, proving that it was the actual cause of the injury. So maybe your neighbors are also spraying the same product. How do you know who actually caused the damage? This is, these are very uh, two difficult factors to prove when it comes to pesticide drift liability. And in order to win a claim, you have to prove all four of these factors. So again, a very difficult claim uh, to sometimes win related to this. So looking at some cases, um, specifically, uh, in the state of Arkansas, there was a claim filed uh, that a pesticide drift um, was negligence or not. And with this, the court looked at a couple of different things. Um, this was a corn crop that was damaged due to Roundup Ultra, um, and the farmer and the pilot were both sued for negligence. The court ended up finding that they were not negligent because there was no evidence to show that. Uh, specifically, the court looked at the fact that the only witness was a pilot and he took all the proper precautions. There were no other witnesses to show that drift even took place. Um, Roundup Ultra is a commonly used herbicide, which is something the court took into consideration. And then the application was made under safe conditions. So here the court said you're not liable for pesticide drift um, in this situation. What could have maybe changed that outcome? Uh, specifically, if the sprayer did not take all the proper precautions, maybe they um, sprayed when it was too windy. If there were any witnesses that actually saw a drift here, there were no witnesses. And then if it was a more um, dangerous chemical, maybe, something that's not as commonly used, the court said that might have changed the outcome. There was a case in Texas um, where uh, a negligence claim actually prevailed when it came to pesticide drift liability. Um, here, of course, different factors. The evidence was there that it was too windy. Um, the product label uh, had warned not to use this pesticide near cotton, and they did anyway. There were witnesses who saw um, the drift. And um, so the court found that this applicator did actually act unreasonably and they were liable for damages. So as you can see, it really depends on the facts of each case whether or not someone would be liable. There are also um, other different legal claims that uh, have been used when it comes to pesticide drift liability, specifically this claim called res ipsa loquitur. Um, this is a doctrine that in some circumstances the mere fact that something happened um, basically raises the inference that negligence uh, has actually occurred. So there's a two-part test to prove this. Basically, the accident is something that would not occur if there were no negligence. And then the thing that caused the injury is actually under your control as the person um, who is liable uh, and required to manage that thing. So, with that, um, the best example that's uh, most commonly used is a man is walking down the street. He passes an open window and a flower barrel hits him in the head. Do flower barrels normally fall out of windows every day? No. So in this case, um, you would be liable under this doctrine of res ipsa loquitur. Uh, with this and related to pesticide drift liability, all of the cases have been out of Texas. Um, a Texas court has found that the doctrine can apply only in aerial applications um, when the discharge of chemicals is sudden and unexpected. Basically, the court said it could only happen if there were um, negligence occurring with the equipment and that equipment is under the defendant's control and therefore they are liable uh, for the pesticide drift damage. Another case um, pointed out in Texas that Drift happens in every application, with or without negligence. And so to prove this claim, you need to show it happens in every single application through negligence. So the court, in this instance, found that there was no liability for the damages here. So these were two Texas courts. As you can see, courts really vary on the outcome related to pesticide drift liability. 
and whether or not someone will be liable for damages. Another theory that's been used in pesticide drift liability claims is strict liability. Um, this is liability that does not depend on actual negligence or intent to harm, but is based on an absolute duty to make something safe and breaching that duty. So the most common example um, is usually a tiger. In this case, uh, we're referencing the Hangover movie, but um, say Mike Tyson owns a tiger, no matter how strong that tiger cage is, if the tiger gets out and harms someone, Mike will be liable regardless of proving negligence. So it's usually something that's abnormally dangerous, inherently dangerous. With pesticide drift, only one state has said that uh, strict liability can apply when it comes to um, pesticide damage. Specifically in Oklahoma, a landowner used 2,4-D on a farm and it killed the neighbor's cotton. So the court found that the landowner um, was liable for damages to the neighbor because 2,4-D is an inherently dangerous pesticide. With a strict liability, um, cotton, of course, is a sensitive crop. What if there is a next door, uh, crop next door and it's sensitive to 2,4-D or another pesticide that can drift easily? So in the future, this is something to think about whether courts would or would not find um, you liable for using maybe a pesticide that's not as commonly used or more dangerous. Um, no other state has adopted this um, yet, specifically when it comes to ground applications. Um, in Washington, however, a uh, court did find strict liability applies just for aerial applications. Then there's trespass, of course, um, whether or not the pesticide drift is trespass or not. In Texas, um, 2,4-D was sprayed and damaged a neighbor's crop, and the Texas court actually found that uh, they were liable for trespass in this situation, so they did have to pay damages. Um, but on the uh, opposite side of it, a case out of Minnesota um, said that chemical spray does not amount to trespass. So it varies here whether or not Maryland would apply one state or the other. Um, it has not been decided yet. And then, of course, there's nuisance. And with nuisance, um, a Minnesota case said that a nuisance claim is available to someone who has damaged by drift. Um, a permanent injunction would be the remedy. So again, forbidding them from using that. They wouldn't actually uh, have to pay damages, but they would be forbidden from using that pesticide um, in the future. But I should note that in Maryland, our right to farm law uh, is a defense to any nuisance claim. That's just nuisance. That's not the other claims that I mentioned. But that's something to keep in mind. Um, this was a Minnesota case. So again, state laws are different. Um, how this would apply in Maryland, my guess is it would probably be dismissed right away because of uh, the right to farm defense that's available here in Maryland. What about hired applicators? Would you be liable for a hired applicator? With this, um, courts will find you liable for any action of your employee, but not usually for the action of an independent contractor. So they will go in and they will look, is this your employee or is this your independent contractor? With this, they'll look at, is this an independent business that you hired? Is this um, person using their own tools or equipment or are they using your tools and equipment? How long is this work? Is it temporary? Is it um, for several months, how long, and does it look like this person's an employee because they've been here for quite a while, or is this person just here for a couple of weeks and obviously an independent contractor? And then, of course, um, does this person work with other people? Do they have other clients, or are they just solely working for you as an employee? Um, with this um, specific to pesticide drift liability, Courts have looked at whether the plane is owned um, by you or the independent contractor or their company, uh, whether or not they've sprayed for other landowners. If usually these two things are met, uh, the court will find that it's not your employee, so you aren't liable. The only exception here is if it's inherently dangerous, um, that strict liability claim could still apply, whether it's an independent contractor or not. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, Alabama specifically found in both aerial and ground applications, if it's inherently dangerous pesticide, um, you're liable regardless of if it's an independent contractor or not. 
And then, of course, um, courts have looked at whether or not you're following the label and violating regulations to determine whether or not you're acting reasonably. Um, a specific example is out of Louisiana. Here, a commercial applicator had been investigated numerous times by the State Department of Ag. Uh, while being investigated, on one occasion, the applicator actually sprayed the ag official who was photographing him from a roadway. Uh, the court agreed that spraying the state ag official was inconsistent with the pesticide label. So uh, spraying uh, maybe an MDA official is probably not an approved use on your pesticide label. Uh, with this, uh, the court implemented the maximum fine, and they refused to turn that over. So just to review, again, uh, cases show uh, this will really turn on proving that negligence standard. And again, as I mentioned, that's sometimes really hard to prove. Uh, things that they'll consider, the number of witnesses. Was a drift cloud seen? Do you have pictures or videos of that drift cloud? Was this a common pesticide used or an uncommon one? And then whether the application was made under safe conditions and whether or not the label was followed and all proper precautions were taken. Um, of course, strict liability may potentially imply in Maryland in the future, but at this point, there are no decided cases related to that. Uh, trespass appears to be a weaker argument in drift liability cases, but again, some states have found that. Um, if you're under investigation by MDA, please don't spray the official. Um, this is a really good way to show the application is outside of the label and a really quick way for liability to be found, um, just in general, if you're not following the label. So um, it says dicamba up here, but this could be any pesticide again. Um, I just recommend uh, specifically in order to manage any potential liability that you follow the label. If you follow the label, the court will probably find you're acting as a reasonable person and will dismiss the case quickly. So you won't have to worry about uh, being liable for damages. Uh, make sure you comply with state law. Check that label. See if there's a 24C label on there and make sure you read that very carefully. Check the Department of Ag um, for any additional re regulations related to that pesticide. Keep an eye on state law for changes. Make sure you keep a strong records of application so you can prove that you were following the label and were acting reasonably. Uh, general liability insurance is an option. Um, however, there have been some issues in the South specifically with the new dicamba products on uh, the general liability insurance for pesticide drift capping at a certain amount, and it's not a very high amount, so make sure you're reading your policy. And then, of course, taking extra precautions. Um, on the contrary, what to do if you experience damage. Uh, first, confirm the damage. Again, as I mentioned, courts like to see actual damage. If you don't actually have a yield loss, um, they're probably not going to uh, find uh, in favor for you when it comes to a lawsuit. Uh, make sure you have evidence, so create records, take pictures, record videos. Um, you can have the State Department of Ag come out and test uh, to see if there was damage from a certain pesticide. However, what the Department of Ag will do with that information is actually determine whether or not they will find that person, and you won't receive any money from that. The Department of Ag will get that money. Um, you can find witnesses as well, as you've seen, courts really like witnesses. If you don't have a witness, uh, the case will be dismissed pretty quickly. Determine, of course, exactly who the applicator was. Again, that second claim that's hard to prove is who actually caused the damage. Uh, calculate and keep records of the damage. Um, of course, as I mentioned with Dicamba, there are class action lawsuits that you could consider joining um, if you feel like that would be a better way to maybe earn some monetary damages. You could determine the best solution with the applicator. Uh, this is highly recommended. Maybe talk to your neighbor. Uh, prevent this from happening in the first place by making sure you're uh, talking to your neighbor and seeing what they're growing. And then uh, crop insurance does not cover um, damage from pesticide drift, but you can exclude it from your APH. So that's something to talk to your crop insurance agent about if you do have pesticide drift damage. Uh, Paul has a fact sheet on this on our website if you're interested in learning more about it. And then we've been posting um, specifically about a lot of the new dicamba regulations on our website as well. And then uh, one final thing that's not related to pesticide drift, uh, the Syngenta uh, big class action settlement, that's still ongoing. So um, just 
hold tight and wait for that. Uh, we will post on our website probably when a final settlement agreement has been made, and that's the time when you'll need to actually fill out forms and take action. So uh, keep an eye out for that as well if that's something that applies to you. And with that, uh, any questions? My contact information's up there. If you have any legal questions in the future not related to pesticide drift, or related to pesticide drift, feel free to email or call. Any questions? Yes. Are you using drift and volatilization in the same definition? Um, yeah. I mean, when it comes to liability, if yeah, she asked if I'm using drift and volatility in the same context. Um, when it comes to if your product causes damage to another person's property, yes, I'm just referencing to any potential damage that could be caused from volatility or from drift. Any other questions? All right, thank you. So, now we know that our chemical could be um, classified as a trespass. So there's always something new uh, to learn of what's going on. So um, we'll hear from a couple more of our um, sponsors. Chris um, Lenowski is here from PNC. So Chris, thank you for uh, being a sponsor today. We appreciate it very much. Well, I'm happy to be here today. Um, a lot of people don't know that we actually specialize in agriculture at PNC. Um, can help you with all financial aspects of your operation. Um, so stop by, see us at our table. Uh, we're happy to show our support. Thanks so much. Uh, Nagel uh, Farm Service, Nagel Grain uh, is here, Nagel Crop Insurance, all the different. So Rob Davis, uh, let's see, is this your first year at a ground me day? Oh, wow. So. Um, New face uh, at Nagel uh, Farm Service, Rob um, Davis is a uh, son of a local farmer in uh, Kent County, so no um, stranger to agriculture, of course, and he worked at uh, J.P. Morgan and has now come um, to help uh, Nagel Farm Service and help farmers with marketing and has um, lots of good comments. So, Rob, thanks for coming. Thanks, Jenny. <clears throat> Um, so I didn't uh, didn't really prepare to say anything today, but I'm, I am going to plug real quick the uh, the grain markets. Uh, wheat was up 22 cents yesterday. Uh, concerns over uh, drought out in the Midwest, uh, so it's giving us an opportunity to price some wheat. So uh, if you haven't uh, priced any wheat for next year, you can kind of take advantage of a bit of a run. Um, and right now, all the pricing and, and, and hedging and everything that we do is kind of dependent on grain that comes through us. But, um, but uh, you know, if, if you're interested in our market updates, we can send that out to, to anyone. So you can reach out to us and, and give us your email and we'll stay in touch. Uh, corn over $4 for this harvest. Uh, great, great place to, to get started selling some bushels and, um, and beans, of course, are, have been on a great run. So quick plug for your grain marketing. Um, thank you all for having me and, and letting me come to, uh, to, to say a few words. And I work right down here in Y Mills, so uh, feel free to stop in and, and say hi at any time. Right. Thanks. So there's a bright future in marketing right now. It hasn't been there for a while. but. Um, just a reminder, we do have a grain marketing group, a timely ag issues group. We meet, meet the first Tuesday of every month at the extension office at 7.30, so you're welcome to uh, come anytime. John Hall is here, no um, stranger of course. John uh, does a lot of different things in retirement, but he works with Maryland Department of Ag and Crop Insurance. So John, he's got a whole list. Watch it out. First question, anybody planting more beans this year than last? Uh, pay attention, either see Rob. I'm real concerned about prices. Um, and I don't know if you heard, uh, President Trump just put a embargo, or not a tariff on Chinese steel. And the Chinamen have a way of coming back at us. Uh, they, they are our biggest buyer of beans. And we also have, or already have record level of beans. So I'm, I'm very concerned about the bean, bean price currently holding, and I think it's time, like Rob said, to forward price. Uh, second thing, I, I work with the, the university as far as crop insurance education. 
we've got a lot of crop insurance fact sheets out there out there at the table and I did just get some MDA calendars and we do have a grand prize to the winner that gets a calendar and can identify the Miss January in that calendar. <laughs> and the, the third thing I want to bring up, uh, I'm teaching down at Chesapeake. I see a lot of young bucks in here that uh, agriculture is getting to be a very uh, a business with very small margins and I think uh, a, a business education is very much needed. I do want to make a plug. Last fall I did a business class down there using uh, materials from uh, John Deere developed for the young business uh, people in the Midwest and I think it's very applicable so it's not necessarily for people that want to continue a degree but for people that need some education just to survive in this uh, environment. I'll be here the rest of the afternoon. Uh, okay, not a sponsor, but I thought maybe it might be a good thing for you to hear today. Uh, Paul Spees is here. A lot of you know Paul, um, a local farmer and also worked for Chester River Association. And he has recently um, been appointed and he now works for the Department of Commerce in agribusiness and energy. So I just kind of wanted um, you to hear from him. And it's nice when a local person um, can kind of take our story and, and help us. So Paul, thanks for being here. Yep, it's uh, been an interesting uh, five months since I started with the Department of Commerce. Main thing is just the message out there that uh, for the administration, agriculture is important. Uh, it's the first time in a while that we've had a represent representative at Commerce to represent just agribusiness. So my role is to help promote job growth, industry sector growth, and, and help any companies that are in the state or want to come to the state, come to the state and be successful. So we have a number of programs out there that can uh, help fund and uh, secure loans and uh, um, and uh, some other things but uh, the main thing is we've done a number of programs with some local pretty important uh, companies to support the sector as we all know the uh, milk the dairy industry is suffering we've just helped uh, the in Hancock the the uh, Lanco Penland uh, milk plant with with a, with a program uh, so things like that where we can help uh, add some stability to an industry or help a new company come to the state give me a call um, definitely want to Help them, talk to them any way I can. So um, thanks for being here, and thanks for the opportunity to, to talk, Jenny.